Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Paul Papp. I'm a sales consultant for Oracle MySQL. And uh, actually, this is my second MySQL meetup uh, meeting here, so forgive my unfamiliarity with what goes on. I know there's pizza, and I know there's a presentation, so I signed up for, I guess, both in this case. So. Um, but anyway, we're talking about uh, topics for this month, and one thing that uh, I don't know if how many might be familiar with or, or uh, have looked at MySQL cluster before? Anyone here? Yeah, okay, sure, good. Uh, anyone know what uh, about it or anything? It's, uh, it's actually uh, really designed for um, whenever your databases, applications have to be up, you know, absolutely positively, no data going down. Uh, it was actually born in the sort of telco world uh, where when you pick up your cell phone and you go to make a call, well, there's a database in between you and the other side that has to map your, your phone number to the other caller and everything, and if that database goes down, then nobody can make any phone calls. So uh, it's uh, very good where um, applications just can't go down, there's money involved, there's a lot of disruption, uh, and it's, it's really designed for a few things here, um, which we'll get into. So. But tonight I'm just going to get into a little bit of, this is just an overview of it, um, design goes of it. It is available uh, as a community server as well as commercial. Uh, we'll touch on the architecture and then go into a little bit of the cluster manager and um, some other resources to get started. So the goals of the cluster are, are for high, from, high performance, uh, high scalability, low latency, uh, you know, 99.9999, depending on you know how how much downtime you can can uh, work with, and uh, at a much lower TCO total pool cost of ownership than uh, other solutions that are out there in the marketplace. So some of the uh, advantages of of MySQL cluster: high throughput rewrites. Uh, everything is in synchronous. Your application is synchronous. Uh, so when you do a write, it's distributed uh, in memory, actually, the, the, the clusters are memory-based. Um, however, they can also be durable and be committed to disk as well. It has a compliant relational uh, thing. Carrier grade availability, shared nothing design. So that means that uh, if one of the clusters goes down, there's, there's full replicas of the data, data sets in the other nodes that are, uh, are connected. Uh, Sub-second failover. Data structures are optimized for RAM. As I mentioned, they don't have to all live in RAM. You could put fairly large databases and have parts of it living in, in, in the RAM and, and other parts living on disk, and it would know the, uh, the differences there. Uh, I'll permit incrementally scale out, scale up, scale online, uh, distributed awareness. Uh, you, you basically set it up as a, a series of nodes. Uh, where you would need uh, a minimum of, say, two data nodes, uh, but recommended, uh, actually three or more is recommended, depending on your application, uh, and being able to, uh, uh, being able to set, set them up so that they are uh, pretty much identical is, is, is what you want each, each node to be. Uh, you'd also have a, uh, a SQL or API node uh, that you can talk to through APIs, such as uh, SQL, C++, Java. Uh, and uh, this allows for the uh, open platform at the total cost of ownership, commodity hardware, no real special high-end servers. It's designed to be like much everything else, MySQL based, uh, to be uh, low, low cost of ownership. So what you're talking here is a distributed hash backend with an ACID relational model, uh, shared nothing, scale on commodity hardware. Uh, implemented as a pluggable storage engine, it's really just another yet another engine within the MySQL architecture. So in addition to MySAM and InnoDB, you have NDB, which is the real engine uh, for MySQL cluster. And initially it did start out as just another engine to be plugged in, but as the needs and the product sort of uh, developed, the, the need to kind of spin off MySQL cluster as a separate product uh, became apparent. And it, it actually now has, in addition to a separate engine, uh, some slightly different binaries that, that go along with that. Uh, automatic user configurable data partition cross nodes. It, it'll automatically uh, roll over your partitions as they, as they fill and, and the data uh, is there. As I mentioned, it's synchronous as opposed to the out of the box MySQL asynchronous uh, proposal there. Sub-second failover and self-healing. 
Uh, also, you can have geographic replication, have your clusters all over the world, really. Uh, and as long as there's uh, enough, you know, low-level network uh, connection, low latency there, you should be fine. Uh, data stored in memory or on disk, it's, it's really dependent on you and your application and actually down to the column level uh, how you want to uh, designate that. Uh, you have logging and checkpointing of in-memory uh, data to disk. Uh, it's really just an automatic mechanism that you know, periodically commits your data, making sure that it is going to remain durable. And then uh, over time you can add nodes, you can do scheme updates, you can do maintenance, uh, all within uh, through the cluster management uh, piece of this. So some of the other folks that uh, have, you know, are using it today, um, as I mentioned, it kind of started in the telco world and uh, I guess uh, the network wor ne networking world as well. Uh, but in recent years, we've had other uh, industries uh, take a look at it and deploy it for mobile content delivery, for example, for IP management, uh, payment gateways, as more money is being transacted on the internet. Uh, the, the need to have that information always available and, and not going down is there. Uh, so if you look at some of these folks here, in addition to the Ericsson, who was actually one of the original uh, creators of this, and Motorola, you now have fo folks like Shopatron, uh, and other in industry, Zillow, which is real estate, uh, which are using this to make sure that they, they never go down. Uh, so it is used for uh, user profile management, session stores, e-commerce, online gaming, which is probably only going to get bigger, uh, application servers, and uh, various other ways out there. Uh, also, some I've also heard of some financials as well. Some ticker applications are using Cluster on Wall Street. <coughs> So overall, here's the uh, architecture. No single point of failure. Uh, your clients could be uh, cell phones, uh, regular clients, uh, et cetera, coming through the API layer, uh, and then uh, on through into the cluster nodes, the data nodes, which is where the, the data is held. Then off to the side, we have our cluster management for monitoring and making sure the applications are, are, are fully aware uh, and being able to, to maintain those. <clears throat> is it up to the application to know where to go? Uh, through the APIs, yeah. The application through the APIs would, would be able to address the cluster and it would take care of, of marshalling the data to right, the... Right, but the application doesn't need to know. No, the right, application yes, doesn't, doesn't say go correct. to this cluster. It doesn't... All the magic right. is you just connect to an API node, which actually used to be called the SQL node, because basically it's the regular SQL interface. So if you think of the API as the regular SQL interface, it's so actually the that, API... So where does that exist? That 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 uh, that node that directs. That is one additional node uh, that needs to, to be set up. So you have two data nodes, uh, an API node, and a management node, typically for or one or more actually. That's kind of the minimal. And if you want, you can set up a data that. node and, a, and an and an API node on the same machine if you right. want. So here's a here's an example of configuration which might help us a little bit here. Uh, we do have a cluster manager agent run, runs on each physical host. Um, no central process for the manager. So they, uh, they're all aware of each other um, from an IP standpoint here. Uh, and it's color coded. So you see that in, in some cases you have your, 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 uh, your MySQL server. Uh, you have your management nodes, uh, your data nodes here. Uh, and then your cluster management agent. And, and they are all aware of each other as part of the configuration. So uh, there's heartbeats in between. There's heartbeats in between that are, are, are making them aware and, and stuff that uh, make sure it's there. More or less saying, are you there? And if not, uh, it'll go into uh, a failover routine. Uh, agents are responsible for managing all the, all the nodes. And then uh, management um, will, will take care of starting, stopping, configuration changes, upgrades, recovering failed nodes, uh, et cetera. So as far as stepping through setting up a, uh, a cluster, you know, basically this is what you do. Create your site, designate your host uh, IP addresses, uh, expand your, your trial ball, define your packages here, um, and then the base direct directory should match up. There is a, a little bit of, of, you know, configuration as to you no know, understanding where you want to put your data partitions and, and everything in the setup. Uh, you create your cluster, um, you know, with a, a list of the, the various nodes that are there. And then, you know, this is where you define what the nodes and process take up for the cluster. And then you just say start, set it up. So very, very straightforward, very much like many other things in MySQL. And then for upgrades, uh, it's uh, self-upgrading. Or you would simply, from the command line, say upgrade cluster to a new package. 
uh, it will automatically upgrade your, each node and restarts the process uh, in the correct order to you know, make sure that nothing gets lost or, or there's any sort of loss of service. Uh, and then without the manager, the administrator must uh, you know, stop each process in turn, start the process. Uh, this is where much of the work of the cluster manager helps to, uh, to you know, make it smoother. And, and there's ongoing work as far as uh, making it even smoother to add data nodes and everything without having to stop clusters and restart them. So inside the box or out of the box scalability, this is a little bit what your partitioning looks like. Uh, you'd have a, you know, a table here with various partitions, and these internally would be mapped into your data nodes. Uh, and so you have uh, the concept of fragments here. So your partition would be mapped into fragment one and fragment two. That would be some you know, piece or some cut up of the, of the data. Uh, and it's automatically mapped to say to data node one and two. Uh, and then you'd also have like a, a fragment three mapped automatically, uh, a primary and a secondary replica mapped to uh, also on that data node. Uh, and then same thing as you go down for these various partitions, your primary fragments and your secondary fragments are mapped across these data nodes as you set up. And again, this is just the simplest case. Uh, as you add data nodes, that's, that's also uh, expanded out. Is data being stored redundantly on these data nodes? Uh, I'm sorry? Is data being stored? Is that yes, yes, uh, yeah, full copies. Uh, so that if one, one node goes out, you have full copy of, of the data on another node. Uh, and so each uh, the uh, data is par partitioned across the nodes, the rows are divided into the partitions, and then there's hash keys and everything uh, in part of the primary key. Uh, each data node holds a primary fragment for one partition and also stores a secondary on the other. And then the records themselves, uh, anything larger than AK, are stored as blobs internally. Uh, really good for key value uh, lookup pairs, that sort of uh, information. <coughs> Shared nothing architecture. Uh, so whenever you update uh, uh, the author, set the country to France, here it's, uh, it's synchronously upgraded across the node group. So that, um, you know, here's our example here, is, is instantaneously updated across the node. And then a little flow of uh, the failure detection, say everything you know, starts off well across your data nodes, you, you develop a problem in one of them, uh, and now it goes down where it'll, it'll logically delete or, or, or not talk to that node anymore. It goes through the process of rebuilding that node, uh, and then rejoins the cluster and resyncs uh, automatically. Is the update a, a synchronous two-phase commit? Yes, in fact I think that's our... Yes, uh, it's, it is a two-phase commit um, that, that does ensure that the data is being uh, recommitted properly. Uh, for online scaling here, example of a new, new node group added, data is repartitioned, uh, redundant data is deleted, and then distribution is switched. So we have our application here, a node group, uh, and then uh, we have it so that uh, the data, say between these two nodes here, are then uh, broken out uh, here. So you have uh, your author ID keys one and three and two and four uh, actually physically spread in two different node groups. Uh, you can also use this to update your schema online and then upgrade your hardware and perform backups online as well. So I, I may have missed this. Um, well, how do you decide, what's the decision point for partitioning the data? Is that, a, is that something that the it's, user it's, defines, or is that internal It's automatic, to or there could be manual. Um, as far as manual, I, I, I'd have to defer to someone, perhaps with a little bit more hands-on experience. Automatically, there are certain parameters you can set as far as you know, partition sizes and stuff, and once it detects that you're going over, it'll fail over onto another partition. But, um, uh, Sherry, I'm not sure if you've... Yeah, I mean, the, what I've played with is just when you have your node groups and you set them up, it just automatically divides it up into however many. So if you have, like, this has two node groups and two each. I, I actually usually like to do an example of uh, three node groups with two each, just because then if you're dividing by two, you don't know which, you know what I mean? Um, so if you had, like, three node groups, then your data would be divided into three parts. And each node group would have two, so you have a redundant copy on each one of those of that one-third of the data. Um, and so there is no, there's not really any magic to doing it. It's one goes down, it just goes to the other right. one. You don't have to do anything, which is the beauty of it, is right. that it's, you know, even as an administrator, there's nothing to do, um, which 
actually probably ends up getting you in trouble if you if you need to do something. But right. I've never had that. I've never been in right. a situation where I've had too. a problem. So. Yeah. As far as geographic uh, replication, uh, because it's MySQL, you can uh, replicate the data to other you know, MySQL servers. Uh, I apologize for this graphic somehow. It got a little, little messed up here, but I think it's, uh, it's supposed to have these two being able to show that you're... Uh, uh, basically, these two are, are replicating synchronously, but then you can have a, a process where the data is also being asynchronously repped out to in a DB or MySAM or other servers on your network for form backup or standby or, or other purposes. When, after something goes down and comes back up, what part is on the application's code and what part happens automatically and how does that happen? Gotcha. Um, with regards to the cluster, you don't have to worry about it going down. With regards to the slave, it would just... No, no, no. no he's saying if one machine goes down in the cluster, a machine cluster. dies, somebody tripped over a power cord, okay. and your <coughs> second node in cluster two is dead. Okay. Okay, so your over. application's still working. Yeah, Everything's would, great. Yeah, the application. Now, you plugged it back in. Yep. I don't know, reformat the disk <coughs> or whatever. Whatever you did, so, or you didn't. You know, yeah. you plugged it back in. Oops, okay, everything's fine. Mm -hmm. um, and it comes back up. Now what happens? How does, you know, that cluster, that, that node is out of date with that other node in cluster two. So now what happens is I think what he's asking. Uh, well, it would still, there's a, a control there where one takes over and it will you know, be in control until, you know, the two sort of sync up and, and get back uh, in sync. So there is the mechanism so that it doesn't the come online fully. When you bring, fully this, when you bring this node back in, is it kept? No queries are going to be run against that until right. it catches up. Right. Right. All, all the others, all the other nodes, will feel mm -hmm. those those queries un, until the the and that, you know, the and, fail came back. And in. then that hap This is automatic. The application Correct. is completely unaware. And is that because there's a transaction mm -hmm. log uh, that's been ready to be applied before it's in operational mode, or why is that? Um, well, the, the, the clusters themselves uh, have, as I mentioned, they, it's not log based. They have full repli full copies of, of the data. So uh, it just detects that one is down, and it'll switch over to one of the other nodes that, that already has a copy of the data. Right, that part I got. Right. How does it know how, how much work there is to catch up? Um, Does it do block level copy or something? Or? Uh, I'd have to I'd have to check on. Yeah, that. I don't I don't know how it does on the line. It is there, synchronous, it, and, and again, this is running in RAM, so it, it's, it, you know this is all much faster than than traditional replication. Um, but you know the, the point of this slide is just to also say that in addition to the cluster itself, you could also have geographic redundancy if you want to keep a copy of it for disaster recovery purposes out to another SQL server. <coughs> Uh, with the, you know, as uh, we've gone from version 6.3 to 7.0 to actually I think it's 7.129 is, is the latest version, uh, there's been enhancements as far as the throughput transactions per second, um, you know, and, and this is available online to various benchmarks and stuff if you're, if you're curious. Uh, this is just a benchmark where 250,000 transactions per minute, minute operations, uh, about 3 millisecond response time. Uh, and this is about a little over four times faster than the previous version. Yes? I have a question about you're indicating that the majority of the database is going to be in RAM? Uh, a good part of it, yes. Yeah. A good part of it. So then you're relatively limited by the size of the data. Yeah, the, the, this, this type of application is kind of dependent on uh, the size of your data. I mean, if you're looking for you know, terabytes, probably not a good fit. Mm -hmm. um, the, I think uh, Pro Services re recommend somewhere between, say, 200 to like a 500 gigabyte database overall. Um, you know, something that could be easily replicated in at least a good part in RAM, and then the other rest of it is on disk. So, so then, then conceptually, this is a con uh, competitor to the total in-memory database. Model. Yeah, there's there's other <coughs> other ones out there. You probably more up on that. Yeah, I mean, well, it has to be fast because remember it was designed for telecom. So it, you know it has to it has to be lightning sure. fast. That might not be you know it might not be so as important for you know let's say Facebook to be lightning fast. Like if you somebody updates the status and and you hit reload on the page and you don't see the updated status right away, it's right. not the end of the world. If I make a call and it doesn't get through to where it's going right away, it is the end of the world because then I go oh my phone company and I can't the, the do a call. The telecom ones are somewhat different in that um, it's almost all telecom. 
Uh, dep depends. Well, the time depends. I had to talk here before but. was for call registration databases, like when your phone mm -hmm. roams between towers and when your phone first comes on. Okay, that'll that be happens right. thousands yeah. of times a minute okay, so all, right, all across right, right. the state. Okay, so, so that, that, would be that was a talk we had once before on that, where it's okay. like, it has to go fast. It the sensor know, data, yeah. yeah. You moved. It has to go and, and the relative okay, record size is okay. The relative record size is fairly small. It's lookup pairs right. here, so it's not like it's a you know long records or anything. It's they're mm -hmm. key value pairs. Yeah, I mean, like I wouldn't run the Huffington Post or like the New York Times <laughs> online with long text articles on 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 but you know in memory. <laughs> no, but part of well, that, the session management part of it, you might want to keep. The se exactly, right. session right. management right. is good for that. Um, yes, I, I believe the minimum memory required is the indexes have to be stored in memory. Yeah, yeah that's, but, that's recommended. But yeah. the indexes have to be stored in memory, but remember you're dividing them on your nodes. So if you have three node clusters and you have, let's say, 32 gigabyte servers, you know, you can have 32 times three, yeah. you know, of indexes only. So if you have more indexes, then you would have less able to store. But. Another question, are you saying memory? We're really talking about virtual memory or, or physical memory. I'm talking physical memory. Virtual um, memory, just be like you might as well start. Yeah, yeah. that's what I'm saying. Yeah, 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 yeah. You're, you're getting solid point? drives, which are <laughs> yeah. just like is RAM on it, you know. So. so does this have a way of keeping, uh, when you set it up, how do you keep right, that from happening? Lock the memory pages. You have to lock them, you have to lock the memory pages? Um, there's configuration. I, I don't know the exact You're swapping box, off. No, the Linux configuration, so okay. that, because like if you just have a standard build where you're like, oh, I'll give it two gigs of swap and you know 16 gigs of memory, you just you have to you make sure that you're not going to swap. You have to turn like swappiness so it turns, so it down. It turns the swapping on. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the machine is 30 is this, gigs of RAM. Is this Linux only? This, or is there like Windows version? No, there, there actually is a Windows version. I actually attended MySQL cluster training, and the lab was set up on Windows, which didn't work so well. So <laughs> <laughs> which is really good because it's easy to simulate a node going yeah. down. Yeah. <laughs> Just wait a little while. Yeah. It's harder to simulate the node going down. So, in the vein that we were just talking about, storing session data. So, yeah. it, it, I understand that it's a, primarily its, its primary goal is in memory, very, very quick, yeah. distributed right. response. Is there a notion of, uh, of flush to disk or you know of, of yeah. archival, at least recently used, yeah. something like that? There, there is, yes. It, it's not like the whole you know database always has to be in RAM. There is a, uh, a component or, or sets of commands that will flush it to disk or synchronize it to disk um, so that you don't have to have the whole thing running in RAM all, all the time. It'll, it'll automatically help take care of that. You mentioned there was a configurable checkpoint so that it, right. after it, a certain period of time, right. it'll flush everything dirty to disk. Yeah. When you add, uh, this may be later, I mean, mm -hmm. but when you add a node because you're out of memory or this or something like that, mm -hmm. do things have to shuffle around? How does the, how the, how does the persistent data deal with that? It, it'll automatically um, go through the process of you know, bringing it up and syncing it with, with the rest of the node. You don't have to rebalance it like you do in Cassandra or whatever. It does it for you. It's so do you have to wait for that act to be done before it's operational? For the well, it, no. If you got the other nodes that are uh, uh, running fine, it'll it'll just wait until it's it's ready to be online, and then it'll become part of the cluster on its own. So if you're if you're looking to add more capacity, though, right. and you know it's you're going to need capacity tomorrow, and it takes two days to build, that that extra node isn't going to be available until right. it's done building out. Right. And and it's going to also put more load on the existing nodes. Correct. A, a little bit, of, yeah, yeah, a little, little more load to, on the other nodes to yeah. replicate. Yeah. Um, but from an application standpoint, you're never aware because you're just issuing a, a request, right? Unless the application is beating the snot out of the servers and you're adding another node because you need more, more. Right, but even there, the application is not aware of what's going on. Mm -hmm. But you and I are aware that it's slow. data lives to different nodes, there may be a long wait until that. If it happens to hit that and so it comes back, right? What else can it do? Well the other the existing servers will still have the data. Right. So you'll but still I, get that. It will it'll be fast. like a data node recovering, will, I think. It won't see, come up until it's all shuffled. But but then how do one you, node. if it if it doesn't redistribute the data over the new node, how do you maintain a um, uh, an even distribution of data? Well the the new node won't be available immediately. Right. And as it copies data from the existing nodes, th that data will still be available on the existing nodes. It's once the, the, the new node is done being built, <coughs> then it will be added to the cluster. 
but there's no data that disappears for a while. It's that we don't get more capacity. So director, though, the distribution of where that data Oh, it's not distributed. The queries are distributed, but the, I think the data the is data copied on, on every single notes. node. As a, every you have no, 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 uh, that's not flexible. That, that's just true. Oh, no. that's, right. that's flexible, but you don't every have any awareness. So that's where I'm coming every, every data node has, has, has a primary and a secondary replica of the data. Okay, then, so there's two then, copies. Then when yeah. you add a node, how do you expand capacity? You're expanding ability within the same amount of data, but you're not expanding total capacity. All right. So what the what the manual says okay. is uh, <laughs> <Now it's failed. laughs> yeah. is it says fun. that if you are using MySQL cluster and you're it's called uh, you're reorganizing a partition, yeah. you're doing alter right. table reorganized part partition. So I guess you do have to rebalance it, right. but that's part of the adding it in right. to add the part cluster the in. Normal DML operations using MySQL cluster data are not prevented, so inserts, updates, deletes are not prevented, which I assume also selects would not be prevented. Mm -hmm. However, it is not possible to form DDL concurrently with table organization, so you can't actually change the table format. You can't add an index or drop an index. So, uh, so the answer is yes, it's magic and... Uh, <laughs> it's great um, technology, it's magic. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. I'm sorry. I thought you indicated on the previous slide that the data could be partitioned. Uh, it's it's an internal partition that it uses. But it's partitioned among the nodes, so that right. if you're not partitioning, you would not have copies of all the data. All right. right. So data data here is partitioned across the data nodes. So internally, <coughs> uh, you know, it, it sizes it based on the, the partition of you know, uh, within a in a table of your records. You know where that physically lives within across your nodes here. Uh, these are in uh, what's known as a primary and secondary fragment. So you, you have this primary and secondary fragment. So each one is mirrored. Um, so you'd have a primary fragment on data node 1 and a secondary on data node 2. But that data does not exist on data node 3 and data node 4. Correct. Uh, correct. Okay. So it's partitioned over node groups and then redundant in those groups. Partitioned over node groups. So we do get okay. so we do, so you get, do get partitioning. Uh, we get partitioning, mm -hmm. we get the increase of the capacity mm -hmm. as you add more node groups. Yes. Okay. Yes, yes. because it's, you're right. As you keep going, then it'll it'll you know add more of those partitions onto those additional mm -hmm. nodes. So if you bring in one new node that has sixteen gig of RAM or something, you get fifty percent of that? Yeah, Always. probably. Yeah. But you would have to bring in nodes and like Redundant pairs or any, any yeah, you can't change the number of uh, nodes in a node group. So you can't have like one node group with three and one node group with four. Yeah, they all have to have the same amount. So, minimum of two. so yeah, in this yeah. in this example, it would have to be a minimum of two in the node group. So yeah, if you had four machines. If you had four machines, you might add yeah. two node groups, for example. So to add to partition again, you get two more machines. Yeah. Right. So you get a, a third node group with two yeah. redundant machines. Yes. Yeah. So, so what, if you want to change the number of nodes, you have to basically shut down. Is that, the, I think is so. that a yeah. user setting or automatic yeah. number of node groups? Uh, that would be part of the configuration. Uh, and also, you, you can, I mean, in a perfect world, you could use on separate machines, but you don't have to. You can have multiple node groups on one machine. You know, you're obviously rolling the dice a little bit there, but... Uh, you can configure that way. Yeah. Right. right. If you really <laughs> want to test MySQL cluster, you can actually test it on one machine. One machine. You really want. In fact, the, the training class, you get one machine to build your whole thing. So um, just an FYI there. Is, is that backup shard, for lack of a better word, the, the, the replicated shard, is that used for anything or does it just pass it there idle? Uh, no, it'll be used. It'll, you know, kind of depending on the request coming in. If, if you know, the, the node, if one node is busier than the other, as part of load balancing, it'll, it'll go to the second chart to, 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 you know, fulfill the request. Does the, does the query node know where the data is, how the data is partitioned, or is it like a scatter gather thing where you shoot it to all the nodes? I think it's a scatter gather sort of, you know, it's, so it's tracked internally, but. So yeah. eventually, I would think, though, since every node has to do every query, regardless of the fact that they don't have any data, potentially don't have any data for it, would there be a query wall that you're going to hit eventually? I mean, I've just read some articles and other stuff where it's like, when you like multicast out a query to five nodes, yeah. they're all busy doing queries, even though four of them don't have the answer. So eventually, at a certain point, the transactional overhead of doing queries for data you don't have, yeah. right. those nodes are busy doing nothing. Presumably, the come back fast. Though. I think you're Hopefully, going to reach. To full table scan, you're, you not. would probably reach the Linux kernel's um, default limit of 10,000 
was it 10,240 TCP IP connections before you ran into the problem of not being able to handle the quick queries from within MySQL. I've actually hit that limit <laughs> with MySQL cluster. I, we, we actually <laughs> almost abandoned MySQL cluster because like, we can't, we're doing these load tests, we can't get more than 10,000 users at once. <laughs> And then we did it with MySQL memory tables, and we couldn't get more than 10,000 users at once. And plus, with memory, it should be quick. The query should be ridiculously fast. Anyway. It is. It but is. You're, you're indicating, you said the queries go to all the nodes. There's no intelligence there. Um, understanding if you had a query which is going on something which can only exist on one node because of partitioning. That, that uh, logic, there's no logic like that. Right. Okay. Um, it lets it lets the nodes figure out right. that, that, that they can't exist. There. Right. There's algorithms in, in between that kind of figure out you know where stuff is and where do you go to to, to, to fulfill, fulfill the request. So, but uh, two was just mentioned. Uh, you know, cluster versus MySQL memory and the memory engine. Uh, some people say, well, why don't you just use the MySQL memory engine? You know, well, with MySQL cluster, you do get higher throughput uh, and less latency, um, and then because you have your table level locking inhibits your memory scalability. And, and it's also, it sounds like uh, the, the kernel is, is part of that as well. Uh, and you have your checkpointing and logging that allows the um, cluster to, to be more durable. Mm -hmm. <coughs> another, another question is how does this respond uh, to multi core or multiple processors? Um, I, you well with us or? I I don't know. I'd have to check. I'm not sure if it's a separate code line now. It clusters at seven one, you know, MySQL's at five five. I'm not sure if, if the same sorts of you know, gains and the newer code lines are, are being ported over to cluster. Uh, I'm sure we'll worry about that in the next few weeks. Um, but as far as the uh, you know, management of it, uh, they're reducing cost of operations. Uh, there's been a lot of work done as far as uh, optimizing the APIs for cluster. Um, so you can actually, you know, with a, a Java app, for example, get your data, get the, the information much quicker than you can uh, through other methods. Uh, and then some um, additional schema and NDB info, uh, table-driven things where uh, if you want to get your metrics as to how your clusters are performing, uh, there are commands uh, for doing that internally, showing your tables, um, which is relatively known in this code line, exposing information as to how you are, you know, how your cluster is performing, uh, resource usage, you know, buffers, you know, debt, node status, all of that. Uh, and then just if you needed to see how it is, you can do a select star from memory usage and get a, a sense for where you stand with your data in your index here. Uh, and if it's nearing a configured limit, then increase the data memory and or index parameters in config.ini. So some of the things we've been touching on are, are, are controlled by config.ini uh, and do a rolling restart. Note. Another example here, how many table scans are performed, <coughs> if your database is slower than anticipated, uh, you can monitor this. And actually I think that where this is going is now with um, Enterprise Manager or Monitor, uh, the cluster information is, is, is in there as well, which I think we'll see in a, a slide or two here. Um, also the Enhancements to Java have to do with the Java API, high performance, um, the interface built upon it uh, uh, makes the persistence API compliant. Um, so if you're using this already, it's, it's a much easier, much faster way of doing it than what was previously done before. I have a question about the slide. So you show JDBC, MySQL, and then NDB API kind of stack, and then you have JNI an ND, ND, NDB API going all the way across, and you're saying it's C++, but is it a pure, is the NDB API, is there a Java version of it, or is it? Yes, there's, there's Okay, so there's, that's fact, a think, little. Um, yeah, here's, here's a Cluster slide I want to show, um, that you can access the data through any of these, um, you know, various uh, methods here. And you have NDB API batched, non-batched, Cluster J, Open JPA, uh, Cluster J, Open JB, J with JDBC, and depending on your operations here, it's going to give you different levels of performance. Uh, so it looks like that the uh, NDBA API batched is your 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 your, your fastest, uh, and conversely, if you go with the Open JPI JDBC, you have more overhead and slower uh, transactions here. Uh, 
Is there a, a, rep a recommended maximum number of copies of the data? Um, not that I know of. So the more copies you have, the slower writes you're going to be, right? Um, hmm. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah. yeah, if you have more nodes and stuff. You have the trade-off of availability and redundancy. But a, but a write is only a write to RAM, not to disk. Correct. Correct. So it's and basically the time that it takes to propagate through the, the, commit the local area. Assuming that all the nodes are all in a local area network, it's the time to propagate across a local area network. Yep. But it is a persistent database at some point, right? Yep. But so it's got to write to the log file. But asynchronously. So it's, it, it knows how to, it, it, it does a poll or something to recover if the node goes down in order to write. Yeah, you have your heartbeats that are, are right, are keeping track internally of, of what's getting committed. Okay, this was just actually the, um, the slide before the, the, the graph there, just kind of um, explaining a little bit more about the cluster data limitations, um, some of the, I guess, behaviors that you'd like to work with that and kind of why it is the way it is. Better JPI performance for insert updates and deletes. Um, beyond 7.1, push down joins, um, linked operation formed by SQL Server. Um, that's the one thing that this isn't good. This is good at you know very simple sort of uh, key value pairs. For something a little more complicated, you can use uh, linked operation. First public query can be scanned, uh, which should result in primary key lookup. For more complex queries, you can have multiple linked operations, uh, and this will help make things uh, faster as far as committing the data to the data nodes. So currently if I'm before seven one and we're joining data across different nodes, is it possible? Does it come back up? Is all the data retrieved? How does that work? Um, I don't know. I'd have to look at that. But with this this enhancement they were seeing a forty two percent or forty two times time performance yeah. gain in, in certain benchmark tests of POCs. And as far as keeping all of this with NDB info and, and uh, the metrics being kept in uh, an internal database, uh, this has now been hooked into the MySQL Enterprise Monitor in the current 2.3 release. Uh, so along with your other um, servers and replications and everything else, you can also monitor how your cluster is performing. And then with this cluster manager, um, this is kind of a new module that's <coughs> continuing to get more more and more work, cluster-wide management, online operations, helping to bring it into a more of a cockpit instead of relying on scripts and, and a lot of things in, in older versions. Uh, so example here, current development projects, if you're, if you want to add some hosts uh, within the cluster <coughs> manager, you can issue an add host command, add the package, give the base information, add a process, and then, uh, and then, then say start, and that will automatically bring that data node online without having to uh, do a restart. I'm sure you know if you start in the same parameter changes. Um, do they share, the baster is private for each node or is it shared over an NFS link or something like that? Uh, I think it's shared over an NFS, um, okay, base directory, yeah. Yeah, I'd say that, that would must be a common I'd have to check, but uh, I think there's a shared disk. Share disk. Well, yeah. <laughs> well, that's probably well, just where no, it's no, no. Well, it out, you know, where it it's where it starts. starts that's where it's it right? Well, like it, we'd have an Equinox box. We, we have several of those at work, and it more power supplies and <coughs> the equivalent of RAID 10 Plus. <laughs> um, so it's fairly unlikely that it'll go down. Yeah, I wasn't sure if it's like these machines except it's locally and ran and half together there. Yeah. It can't be that big just to like push with our signature. No, I was just telling her where to do the upgrade to 7.0. Like it's telling the director to drop, you know, from yeah, dad, wherever you install your MySQL junk. Yeah. Sure, it's not all sharing the same MFS drive. Oh, so you think that's a, so the base there is private, I but the same. It's a private di directory on each machine, but it's the same path on every yeah, machine. Yeah, that command add package, and then it tells it the base directory on, on those machines to which they're going to install those base packages to. Oh. oh, so they are private. Okay. Thank you. Or it might be local packages where it's starting to grab the new package and add it to. I'm sorry? 
sorry? It could be the local path from yep. where your things start to right. start. Yeah. And then, yep, and then cross across. So some real world examples of, of this, the uh, uh, World Cup this year, using MySQL cluster behind the scenes for uh, service delivery, uh, supporting all of the routing, billing, messaging, signaling, and then allow them to basically stay up and we're very happy with the, the output there. And then Shopatron, which is an e-commerce, starting to see this now more and more in e-commerce, um, uh, being able to use a cluster for uh, scaling out the back end, user authentication, session management, uh, low cost scalability. So. Yes. Any more to get started? I think uh, you probably got the web page there, right, Sherry? Um, yeah, but, you know, that's, that, those are useful, too. Is there any more, more questions? So, how does this stack up, or is it anywhere near being in competition with Oracle Rack? Uh, well, this part of it would, uh, I, well, to be honest, I, I'm not as familiar with Oracle Rack. I'd say from a total cost of ownership standpoint, it's probably ahead. Um, so, unless you've got a lot of money to throw at something, this is... Rack um, is also a shared disk yeah. architecture, and it's a shared, shared nothing. Shared nothing architecture. So, on the one hand, it's in a different class, on the other hand, you know, some people prefer one over the other. So. Yeah. Uh, are you, a lot of folks running Oracle Rack here? Or, yeah. Yeah, we have a monster EMC box. Okay. And it has fiber channel, multiple fiber channel yeah. connections between all the nodes. It's a substantial piece of hardware. So if you wanted to do just a simple session management or something to support e-commerce, would you put it on that, or would you look at something like this? Um, I mean, what's the trade-offs for the implementation? Uh, well, the site's 10 years old, so mm -hmm. it's not really, that's like a tertiary mm -hmm. concern because there's so much legacy code and packages and everything else, it's really not a... Okay. If they're building the site from new okay. today, yeah. um, this could definitely be a consideration, mm -hmm. um, mainly because it, it is more scalable. I mean, they're still, they've been working on now, they're on week six of adding a third node right. to the database. <laughs> um, well, okay, but to their, to their credit, when they put the second, I'm sorry, the, the fourth CPU in, they bent one of the pins on the back plane, Ooh. and the node kept bouncing, Ooh. and it was causing... It caused all manner of unhappiness with rack because it was up and then it was down. And then it'd say it's up and then they'd start talking and then it'd be down again in the middle of the process of saying it was up. Mm -hmm. And uh, so now they got that straightened out. I think they're they're getting things lined up and getting it ready to go. But it was supposed to be in before the holiday season. And it didn't happen. How about data corruption? Did you see any? No, no data corruption. <clears throat> I have a quick question about the query distribution. So uh, I've got, let's say I've got a 30-node cluster. Mm -hmm. okay? uh, and so theoretically, there, are, there would be 15 active nodes that would have 15 shards of my data on my mm -hmm. table. So I'm going to send a request to the API node. The API node is going to broadcast. I'm going to say, hey, everybody who has this table start doing the work, right? And each one of them has a little bit of it. Yeah, well, it, it would go to, okay, what partition that's pointing to a certain data node and primary and secondary fragment. So, so you couldn't have, right, but it, let's say it's a, it's a table that splits over multiple partitions. Can you do that, actually? I, I should ask that question. Yeah, you, you'd have the table, if you saw the, the, the slide from before, where you'd have, depending on, you know, where you are and how much data, it would map parts of the table and data node one and two and then another part in three and four. Okay. On. All right. So, yeah. so I have multiple nodes that are all churning through their pieces of the data too, and they're going to return and they're going to return their shares, right? The API node has to has the job to aggregate. Yeah. Right. So um, my node six is a piece of junk. It's a, it, it fails. Just okay. just out of not it fails. Will the API node? Well, how long will the API node wait basically to, to get a response? Is it pinging at the same time? So yeah, it, it's I think it's about a, a second every second and a half. There's a heartbeat that goes through, and as an acknowledgement. Is the um, API the master or is the management node the master? Uh, the, the API node is the master. The API node is the master. So it knows, okay, hey, number six went down, but I know the number eight has my piece of data. Right. I'm going to reissue that query. Right. Now, in, in, when it's doing that, is it 
is, does the query internally, I'm sorry, this is my short question turning into a multi-part long yeah. question, I apologize. Um, is it returning rows as it, so if I'm node one and I'm still churning through, do I return rows as they as I find them, or do I return them, do I you know, bulk wait and then bulk them up and send them up? It'll bulk them up in a hash. And okay, all right. I'm done now, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Where's it landing at? Where's it landing on this data? The API node? Uh, no, the data node. The data node is where the, the data would be there. The API node is just kind of governing. Is it round robin the data nodes, or how does that work? Uh, I'm not sure of the exact how it's doing it. It's part of the configuration. Hashed on the primary key. Yeah, yeah, it is. It is primary that, but that's, that's how it knows where to go. But, but where it's landing the data and accumulating it and grouping it. And all. If it's trying to avoid a single point of failure there. So the uh, so next question is, is it, like we have the MySQL connector. I'm yep. using the JDBC jar for that. Mm -hmm. um, is there a different jar file? Yeah, yeah it would be the, the cluster J connector. <coughs> and how much different is the connection string? I don't know. Yeah. It's the not there. that much different, but you can do different things. Yeah. Okay. So if you use like connector J, you know how there's a lot of stuff you can do. Okay. Right. And no, you uh, use connector uh, J. Yeah. If you use connector J, anyway, there's a lot of different stuff you can do and you can set up. There's a lot of objects you can play with. Um, same thing with cluster J. It's just, so, I mean, you know, I don't know if the, you know, I think they all try to follow kind of the ODBC format string, you know, of like database, host, password, username. Um, but I can't promise you that, but. Well, the, the for example is if the, the, I guess the thing that you call the conductor, the director, mm -hmm. if that machine goes down, um, then how does it know to go to the second, is there a way to specify a second IP address of backup director, or is that not how um, the architecture works? I think you would, you would put that across multiple nodes as well. Um, but how would you, spe so, so you connect to an IP address, and then it would get, once you, Talk to, start talking to that director, it would give you back a list of, of the other backup machines, of the other, uh, I guess the, the. Uh, yeah, so here, here we have our example configuration where you have MySQL across, you know, two machines here, and management across those machines as well. So if, if this thing goes down, you have redundancy here, uh, and then the actual data where this is stored is stored on these across these machines down here. Well, I'm more concerned about, well, like, as it turns out with the <coughs> doing the configuration at work, um, as it turns out, most of the applications had a load balanced Oracle connection. Mm -hmm. Some of them didn't, and when they restarted Node 1, a bunch of jobs all of a sudden, all of a sudden started failing because the client was literally button. only pointing at one node, and it only knew that one node. Um, okay. And so what I'm concerned about is you set up the, the, the connector for the application, and it says, I'm going to go to 192.168.0.10. Is there a way to say, oh, by the way, you can also go to 011 to, to, to be the entry point. So if 010 goes down, then it has the smarts to go to 011 if 010 doesn't respond right away. I think this is through the, through the agent process here. It, it'll kind of keep in sync as to what's up and what's down. No, but that, that's so, no, that's that's no good. Over in the client but side that's no good. Because, the server server side. because if I start up, then the guy that I'm going to connect to is not there. He can't tell me where the other guys are. You have to have some... Something that would know something that. Something that knows that, knows that, that ahead of time. Fail right. was local there might be a setting in the connector where you specify a number of... Yes. You, you might you yeah. one or two of them. So you have so servers good. that are not running MySQL and they're just there to add extra data numbers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is that a recommended configuration? Uh, well, actually, a recommended would we have at least three data nodes and uh, like a warm backup. Um, so yeah, so you you would, you know again going through our example configuration here, you would create your site, add well, your well, packages, well, right. all of that. Go through the, just just word wise. Mm -hmm. So with a recommended to have at least two MySQL servers and then three data nodes with a warm backup. Yeah, that would be a... So a six-node configuration is sort of minimum. Right. 
Right, and you, you can have different parts of that across, you know, uh, machines and stuff. And the memory requirements is just for the SQL, MySQL server, not for the data nodes, or do you have memory requirements for them as well? Uh, you'd want to keep those uh, identical, pretty much. Um, so, so you'd have you know the same, you know, the same operating system, the same memory configurations. Uh, I, off the top of my head, I don't know what those are. I'm sure there's recommend, recommendations there. So, well, thank you so much. Thank you.